Our topic today is the Ground Zero Mosque, what you need to know. Many of you probably have uh, opinions about whether an Islamic community center and mosque should be built near Ground Zero, but tonight is actually not about whether the people behind the Park 51 project have a right to build it or whether doing so is wise or insensitive. Tonight is about what we need to know, each of us, to make an informed judgment about all of this. A few years ago I wrote a book called Religious Literacy. The main argument of that book was that America is one of the most religious countries on earth and yet Americans know hardly anything about religion. They know very little about their own religions and they know even less about the religions of other people. According to a poll released just a couple weeks ago by the Pew Research Center, 30 percent of Americans say that they know not very much about Islam and 25% say they know nothing at all. As a result of this ignorance, when events such as 9-11 or the threatened Quran burning in Florida and the proposed construction of the Park 51 project in Lower Manhattan arise, they force us to talk about Islam, but our conversation almost always devolves into platitudes about how Islam is a religion of peace or Islam is a religion of war. And judging from the comments I saw today on the BU Today website after it ran a piece about this event. I'm not so sure that our Boston University community is exempt from this kind of you know, incivility. A few weeks ago, uh, Adam Seligman, a colleague of mine in the religion department right over here, uh, contacted our chair, Deanna Klepper, who is right here, and suggested that we as a department should try to do something to raise the level of conversation about this controversial subject. So before we begin, let me be clear about what we are um, trying to do here. And we are not trying to convince you to oppose this project or to support it. Our goals are twofold. To attempt to make the conversation about this project here at Boston University more informed and to try to make it more civil. We have three speakers tonight um, sitting here in front of you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Keisha Ali who is over on, on your right, is an assistant professor in the Department of Religion. She specializes in Islam. She teaches courses on such topics as the Quran and Islamic law. And she has a book out this week, this week uh, from Harvard University Press called Marriage and Slavery in Early Islam. Uh, Tina uh, Perohit in, in the middle is also an assistant professor, a new addition to our Department of Religion. Her area of specialization is Islam in South Asia with a focus on India. She's currently working on a book project called The Modernity of Muslim Identity, Ismaili Sectarianism in Colonial India. And finally, last but not least, uh, closest to me on your left, uh, Christine Hutchison Jones is a graduate student in Boston University's Division of Religious and Theological Studies and a tutor in the writing program. She's writing a dissertation on Mormonism in the American imagination with special attention to the ways in which anti-Catholicism has informed critiques of Mormonism from uh, the 1890s, is that right? To, to the present day. Um, each of our speakers will talk for just a few minutes. I have a little invisible, like, whatever you call that thing. Um, yeah, okay. I, that seemed too violent, you know, for the, for the circumstances. So, uh, noodle. Um, for if they go over five or six minutes. So there'll be very short presentations, and then um, we will uh, ha open it up to responses which, uh, and um, reactions, which I trust will be both informed and civil. So uh, thank you all for coming, and we'll start with uh, Professor Keisha Ali. Thanks very much. I understand the air conditioner is on in the back, so one of my students is standing right back. If you can't hear me at some point, wave your hand around, and I'll speak up. Okay. So one obvious fact that has been missing from a lot of the current debate about the proper place of Islam and Muslims in America is this. Islam has been an American religion for about four centuries. The first Muslims in, to live in the colonies that became the United States were slaves. Probably somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the African slaves in the United States were Muslim. We know little about most of them, not surprisingly. Some of them were literate, 
a few were scholars in their homelands. Omar ibn Sayyid, enslaved in the southern United States, wrote an Arabic autobiography, which survives in a North Carolina college archive. The largest single ethnic group of Muslims in the U.S. today is African American, but the line of Muslim practice has not been unbroken. If you want to learn more about that, you can take my class on Islam, Religion 214. Another important wave of immigrants, this time voluntary rather than forced, came in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. Migrants from Lebanon and Syria came and settled across America, very often in the Midwest, working as peddlers, traders, farmers. These early Arab Americans were mostly Christian. Even today, most Arab Americans are Christian, probably something that most of you didn't know. The earliest recorded Muslim prayer group was in Ross, North Dakota, of all places. They met in a private home beginning in 1900, and they built a mosque in 1929, although that building is no longer standing. The oldest purpose-built American mosque that still survives today is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. It's now called the Mother Mosque of America. It's on the National Register of Historic Places and it originated in the effort of about a dozen immigrants. First, they formed the League of Bountiful Flowers, which became the Rose of Fraternity Lodge, and then in 1934, the current building opened with an English sign proclaiming it a Muslim temple and an Arabic sign reading a Nadi al-Islami, the Islamic Club. Important communities in Michigan and Ohio also date from these early decades of the 20th century. The liberalization of immigration policies in the 1960s, including the overturning on bans on the entry of Asians into this country, brought further waves of Muslims to America, many from India and Pakistan. They tended to be educated professionals, doctors, engineers. In collaboration and sometimes in conflict with previously established communities, they built numerous mosques and Islamic cultural centers throughout the United States and started organizations that were often based on religious rather than ethnic lines. Still, though, it's important to note that many mosques remain more or less segregated by ethnicity. This is more often the case for social events like fast-breaking dinners during Ramadan, which just ended, and less the case for something like Friday prayers, where convenience to the workplace in the United States, which has a Monday to Friday work week, tends to be more determinative of who attends. More recently, the influx of European and African, African refugees has again altered the demographic picture of American Islam. What Islam looks like in America in 2010 depends very much on whether you live in San Francisco or in Iowa or in Tampa or in Massachusetts. And if you live in Massachusetts, whether it's Roxbury or Quincy or Methuen, the Pew Foundation estimates that just under 1% of the American population is Muslim. It's about 2.5 million people, and estimates of numbers are always political. These have been contested. But even within that 2.5 million, there's a great deal of diversity. Various ethnic groups, classes, political and religious tendencies vie for presence and influence inside the Muslim community and for presence and influence outside of it. Who will get heard when they speak as a Muslim? The tension between unity and fragmentation is a constant. How should Muslims relate to broader American society? Some want to evangelize, if you'll pardon the borrowed term. Others simply want to socialize with other people who speak Urdu or eat Somali food for dinner or fulfill their religious obligations in a convenient place. As with other religious groups, Muslims in America struggle to sort out how to be both responsible inhabitants and citizens of this nation and effective participants in a broader global community. Not just the community of Muslims, but also the world. I want to just close with a very quick word about the current climate. It's one of intense anxiety and preoccupation with the issue of Muslims in America and Islam in America. In 2006, though, 
there was a gathering of European and North American Muslim thinkers, professionals, and activists in their 20s and 30s. And what was most striking from the conversations that happened during this get-together was that the European Muslims were preoccupied with issues like identity and integration. And the American Muslims just simply weren't. This was not very long ago. And I imagine it won't be that long, at least I sincerely hope it won't be that long, before the current preoccupation with identity, with fear, with anxiety dies down. And American Muslims go along with the business of being Americans and being Muslims. Thank you. Thanks, Keisha. Um, what, what's ringing in my ears there is hearing, you know, uh, what, what you uh, get about Islam depends on which Muslim you hear, and also what you see of Islam depends on where, on where you look. So thank you for that. Um, Professor uh, Prohit is going to uh, speak about representations of Islam, I understand, in, in, in the West. Uh, and specifically within the context of um, the, t the, st the specific topic of discussion today. So arguments against the quote, we have to put this in quotes, mosque at ground zero, rely on a specific logic. And this is that those who will participate in the community center and the people who attack the World Trade Center on 9-11 practice the same Islam, okay? So I want to explain in the few minutes I have here two basic points. First, why Islam is not the same in different times and different places. And second, that referring to the proposed center as simply the mosque perpetuates this idea that Islam is a timeless and a homogenous entity, separate from culture. So why is Islam not a religious and cultural monolith? Well, Islam originated in the Arabian Peninsula, but it spread globally and very fast. When it spread, it transformed, and it was transformed culturally. That is to say, in each context, where it be Africa or India or Indonesia, to just, just to name a few places, Islam took on a different form. This is because the character of the religious tradition was shaped by local traditions and cultural practices. So today, this is all very basic information, but I think it's necessary to repeat, we have Chinese Muslims, and you have Indian Muslims, and you have Senegalese Muslims, who actually all practice very different forms of, you know, of <coughs> religious practices and are Muslim in very different ways, right? So this, this sort of brief point I'm trying to talk about with diversity, sort of picking up a little bit on what Professor Ali just said. So what is the, what, why, why do we want to emphasize diversity in Islam? What, what, does, what does this question of diversity have to do with the communities, the Islamic Community Center project today? Well, like the many moments in history where Islam became something new in every different cultural context, in Manhattan, with this center, there will be yet another configuration of Islam, right? One that is shaped by both local and immigrant groups, such as Palestinians, African Americans, Bangladeshis, just to name a few. And dis so, so, in or so if you describe the site simply as a mosque rather than an Islamic community center, we perpetuate this idea that religion, specifically Islam, is separate from culture. So what I want to underscore, underscore here is that, you know, this, this center, this proposed Islamic community is both a cultural space as well as a religious space that will include a mosque, but will it also include a library, a swimming pool, an auditorium, and restaurants, right? And 
all of these spaces will be negotiated in new ways because of this configuration of um, all the different all the different types of Muslims, right? So, as such, and this is my final point here, this Islamic Center would represent yet another moment in this history of Islam I just explained, and this new formation, this new instantiation of Islam, would be all will would be altogether distinctive. It would be uniquely American and peculiarly New York or even lower Manhattan. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Tina. When, uh, yeah, are, the, are there some people here who want to move in? There's a little more space here. <coughs> Great. I'm reminded in hearing uh, this, th this uh, part of the conversation about what is Islam when we were talking about hiring Professor Purohit. And there was uh, some c uh, discussion even inside our department about what Islam was because we tend to associate Islam with the Arabic language, with the Quran, and especially with the Middle East. And here's a, here's a scholar who specializes in Islam in India. Um, that's weird, you know, isn't, isn't, isn't Islam supposed to like, be in the Middle East, right? And, and be, uh, aren't Muslims supposed to be speaking Arabic? Well, most Muslims in the world don't speak Arabic. And the largest Muslim country in the world is, is Indonesia in terms of its population. So um, thank you for that. We're going to move uh, from, from uh, Islam around the world and Islam in America to uh, a, a very brief uh, history lesson, I suppose, of, uh, of non-Christian religions in, in America with um, uh, Chrissy... Uh, Hutchison Jones. The United States has a long tradition of tolerance of which we can be justly proud, but the nation also has a history of consistent fear and prejudice toward minority religious groups. Even the early Puritan colonists who came to North America seeking their own religious freedom handled difference by limiting people's rights within the community and, in the most extreme cases, banishing or executing dissenters. Such opposition to groups outside the mainstream continued after independence as the new nation struggled to define itself politically, socially, and religiously. Throughout the 19th century and long into the 20th, old world religions like Judaism and Roman Catholicism and new religious movements like Shakerism, Christian science, spiritualism, and Mormonism faced legalized discrimination, organized political opposition, and even violence. During the 20th and 21st centuries, increasing populations of Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, and a variety of homegrown so-called cults have raised the suspicions of more established Americans, many of whom were and are Protestants. The differences between these communities and the diversity of belief and practice among individuals within them notwithstanding, minority religions have often been lumped together as un-American thems, whose very presence threatens the United States' status as a moral, tolerant, and democratic society. One of the most persistent claims about minority religions is that they are sexually immoral. Deviant sexual behaviors, many Americans believed, sprung from the devaluation of women, and minority religions have frequently been accused of holding women's bodies, lives, and souls cheap. In the 19th century, for example, Catholic priests were widely believed to treat convents as brothels, forcing nuns to serve them sexually behind closed doors while presenting the lie of celibacy to the public. Similarly, the Mormon practice of plural marriage, in which a small percentage of Mormon men took more than one wife, was regarded as the widespread enslavement of unwilling women to serve the unbridled lusts of the Mormon priesthood. In spite of the fact that Mormons discontinued this practice in 1890, polygamy continues to loom large in the American imagination. HBO's popular series Big Love and the new TLC reality series Sister Wives profile the normal-looking polygamists living secretly among us and the struggles that the wives in particular face, reinforcing concerns that deviant behaviors are ongoing, now hiding in plain sight. The sexually voracious Catholic priest, too, has become a stock character in American culture, a fact only exacerbated by the ongoing sex abuse scandal. In both cases, the acts of individuals are made to stand for all. Americans have also frequently feared that members of minority religions are at least unfriendly and at worst concealing violent intentions toward their neighbors. Any hint of religious exclusivity, claiming that one's religion is true with a capital T, is viewed as hostility toward other faiths. This is especially true of communities that actively encourage conversion, who are accused of gaining converts through manipulation, threats, and even outright kidnapping. 
And once inside, or so the stories often go, there is no escape. Such groups are suspected of punishing internal dissent with violence and even death. Given such fears, space is not accessible to the general public, the Catholic confessional, Mormon temples, or the Muslim holy city of Mecca, to name a few, are regarded as dangerous. And Americans' imaginations have run wild with regard to what exactly might be going on in there, from human sacrifice to sexual abuse to the recruitment of religiously motivated terrorists. Finally, Americans have often viewed these groups as incapable of participating in our democracy, if not committed to destroying it. Many Americans long feared that Roman Catholics were more loyal to the Pope, viewed as a foreign dictator operating among us through an army of cardinals, bishops, and priests, than to the United States government. John F. Kennedy had to defend himself against this perception in his 1960 bid for the presidency. As recently as 2007, another Massachusetts politician, Republican candidate Mitt Romney, had to respond to fears that as president he would run the government according to the wishes of the Mormon prophet. Even groups without a clear centralized authority face such accusations. In the early 20th century, numerous variations of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion circulated in the United States, including some half a million copies printed in the 1920s by automobile industrialist Henry Ford. The Protocols, which purportedly revealed a plan for world domination issued by a secret committee that controlled the world's Jews, was proved to be entirely false, but the damage that even unfounded accusations cause could not be entirely undone. In keeping with such conspiracy theories, Americans have feared that members of minority religions would undermine the justice system by lying under oath to protect one another, would abuse the democratic political system by voting as a bloc according to the orders of their leaders, and through such machinations, would undermine or infiltrate the government on behalf of their priests, popes, prophets, rabbis, gurus, or imams. Thus, some of the current responses to Muslims in the United States reiterate anxieties older than the nation itself. Throughout our history, Americans have sought to defend our most cherished values by placing limits on groups that appear to some to be dangerous to individual liberty, religious freedom, and democracy. Thank you, Chrissy. I'm, I'm intrigued by that notion of, of uh, you know, appealing to our cherished values to, um, you know, in, in some cases worrying that we need to sort of set some aside in order to sa safeguard, uh, safeguard others, right? Okay, we have, um, we have set aside about half of our program for questions from students, so I'm eager to hear from the students are, who are here if you have responses or, um, or reactions, and I continue to thank you all for sitting uncomfortably wherever you are or sitting comfortably for those who came early. Um, but uh, we have some microphones. We have actually two students. This is being recorded, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. And, um, and we will uh, proceed with the mics. The mics don't really work in the room. They're sort of virtual over here. So don't be confused when you speak and, uh, and uh, don't hear your voice amplified. So questions or comments from students here? Um, th this question may be unfairly broad, but I, I, I think it's key, so I'm going to ask it. Um, why have the false, other than the obvious with 9-11, why have the false narratives about Islam been so difficult to dispel in this country? May I take a, a little stab at that? Um, a partial answer is that negativity sells. I think that in the current climate, what you see is the media saying, Muslims are scary, don't you agree? And then running it on a loop, right? And then getting people's reactions and then polling people about the reactions of these people. So I, th I think part of it is artificially created and sustained. That said, the kinds of things that Chrissy pointed out about the history of representations of others. You know, I heard some people trying to suppress a little laugh when we talked about the Pope as a foreign dictator, right? I mean, that's passe. Most people don't think that way anymore. But 
there's a long history behind that. Similarly, there's also a long history, it's not invented by Fox News, of treating Muslims as others. And I'm working on a project right now that looks at medieval Christian writings about Muhammad and then more recent European writings about Muhammad up through the Danish cartoon controversy and, and the Pope's remarks in 2005 and so forth. And what you see is the recycling of tropes that work, right? Uh, some people call Muhammad the Antichrist. Some people call the Pope the Antichrist. You know, it, people are others and, and people want to make that work. What you also see though, and what's encouraging is that at various points, you get breaks in the narrative and new ways of engaging with people start to be possible. And so from the 18th century on, you also have, say, a British biographical tradition of treating Muhammad as embodying certain kinds of heroic elements as well. So I think it's possible to change the way people talk if everybody starts talking in ways that aren't immediately reducible to sound bites. And this evening is meant to be that in part. Other questions, and if you have a question, um, you, can you hand it down to this gentleman over here? And if you have a question, um, the next question even, or just raise your hand and we can get a mic to you. Um, so, yes, sir. Okay. And could you stand up and speak? All right. um, I had a question, and I guess it's, it's going to uh, take a while to develop, but I guess it sort of stems from, um, I don't know if you're familiar with what Howard Dean said. Um, do you want to was, recapitulate for people who didn't hear it? What's that? Do you want to just? Oh uh, yeah, my question sort of stems from what Howard, what the what comments Howard Dean made. Um, if you're not familiar, I think he said in effect, basically we should we should have a debate on whether or not people should build a community center because that was good like within a democratic society. And I don't think what he said was bad just by itself. <laughs> or certainly not in comparison to what someone like Newt Gingrich said, which was basically like building a community center is tantamount to like spray painting a swastika on a Holocaust memorial. But I think it's insidious because it sort of adds to someone who follows Newt Gingrich, his line of sort of like flawed reasoning. Because I think, you know, throughout the debate, no one's really said, you know, no one has the right to build a community center and practice their religion. That's not really questioned. But I guess what I'm saying is like whether where people practice their religion and which religion they choose to practice is not subject to sort of the, the approval of, you know, members of a, of a society. But, um, you know, like in my opinion, whether or not people can practice their religion, like the debate over that has no place in an open society. I'm just wondering if you think it's ridiculous that we're even having a debate that like that people are demonstrating in the streets and you know like passionately against this like whether or not you think the debate itself is ridiculous. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Tina, do you want to do you want to do that? Um, well, if I hear you correctly, you're you're asking whether um, there is whether whether um, religion you know, help me clarify this a little bit, Steve, whether this is a public sphere, private sphere kind of problem. Yeah, what, what I'm hearing, what I'm, and if I can reframe your question, it may be exactly or not, but what I'm hearing is, is, uh, is isn't it legitimate or is it not to have, to have this debate, right? I mean, if, if, if the debate about the First Amendment rights has been set aside, it wasn't set aside early on, but it has been largely set aside. The conversation has moved toward, is this the right thing to do? Is this the wise thing to do? And the question is, is that a legitimate debate? Or are the people who are saying no to it just sort of Islamophobes and we shouldn't be talking with them and et cetera, et cetera? Or are there like, legitimate points to be raised on both sides? And what might, might the debate help us clarify you know, what this country is about and what Islam is about? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. OK. So yeah, and I, I, I mean, I think that it, it's it's a very legitimate question, and 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 whether you know whether we should be debating this or not. But I think that in that that question itself, you know, the nature of the debate. I think that one thing that is underlying all of this is that we can't and that we can't get around is that there's this uh, there's serious Islamophobia that's going on, right? And that this is sort of the this is what we have to address. So the argument can be made. Well. 
well, we don't mind that they build a mosque. We just don't want them to build it there, right? That's a very common argument and would be considered a very, you know, like, you know, we're not opposing it. We just don't want it there. And that's one kind of argument. But I still would say that um, the impulse, where that is coming from, um, there's definitely something going on that relates to um, this problem of Islamophobia. I mean, there's, there's just something there. And that's what needs to be unpacked. That's what needs to be um, dealt with and addressed in, you know, in this context. Let me, be, before we move on to the next question, do we have another one over here? Let, let me just, uh, if I can, I'm supposed to be mostly quiet over here, but um, I have to say, I have some, some reservations about the use of the word Islamophobia in this, in this context. I think that it tends to be a conversation stopper, right? I mean, I, I would tend, you're an Islamophobe, I'm not going to talk to you, or you're an Islamophobe, that's all that, in other words, it's a kind of pathological uh, analysis of the circumstances. And I, I, I just wonder whether it's more useful to address the specific claims that are made or it, the other word we've heard a lot um, from it, I think all three of the speakers is the word anxiety, to address the anxieties um, rather than to move in the direction of, of labeling it, um, these things Islamophobia. Now, you may obviously want to disagree with me. I would, I would want to disagree. And I mean, I'd like to hear what some of you all think, you know, in the sense that I think that there are just some basic sentiments that people have that we can, whether we're going to call it anxiety or Islamophobia, um, that people have, uh, at, where that fear comes from, right, is what we need to sort of understand, is that there's misrepresentation, there's a long history of misrepresentation um, of Islam going back to the Crusades, into the 19th century, and to today. And so um, whatever we want to call it, I think we're talking about the same sort of thing, which doesn't mean we need to just stop there. We need to kind of figure out what this is, where it's coming from, um, and, and, and how do we sort of become more informed about Islam. Okay, uh, no, I actually want her to, her to be able to get in. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that all three speakers have mentioned this idea of the other in American society, and I was wondering, what do you think the main you underlying... You speak up, because they can't hear oh, yeah. you on this um, side. I think all three speakers mentioned the idea of the other in American society, and I was wondering, um, what is the main cause behind this? Why is it Islam that is picked when technically any other religion outside of your own could be considered an other? So why is it specifically... Islam, do you think it stems from 9-11, and that, is that specifically the reason, the cause of this entire th belief of the other? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just Islam right now. And yes, 9-11 has a great deal to do with that, and the media also has a huge deal to do with that. I mean, they were making jokes during the uh, 2008 presidential campaign that John McCain never appeared without having a, an image of the Twin Towers um, behind him. So there's this push to keep 9-11 in front of us. But um, being afraid of the other is its a, a very helpful and convenient way to define who we are. And that's something that we've done as a, as, as a new nation, bringing together a very diverse group of people with different backgrounds, different nationalities, different races, different religions. We had to figure out who we are. And that's been a process that's been ongoing throughout our history. And there's always somebody. And sometimes there's more than one somebody throughout the 19th century. I mean, anybody who wasn't a mainline Protestant, A, didn't get to define what mainline Protestantism was, B, didn't get to define what Christian was, and C, really didn't get to participate in the discourse. And um, to speak a little bit back to the debate issue, whether we want to have the debate or not, whether the debate is reasonable or not, we have to have the debate because there are people out there who don't understand Islam and who are afraid of religions that are made to appear frightening. And if we don't address their concerns, then we can't change their minds. And this is something that religions and ethnic minorities in the United States have done over and over and over again. So right now it's Islam, and yesterday it was somebody else, and tomorrow it will be someone different. And I just also add, for those of you who are a little older than most of the students in the room, you might remember the Cold War. Right? The other isn't always a religious other. Sometimes it's a political other, like a communist, right? This is also um, you know, a conversation we could have had after 9-11 that we didn't. Because after 9-11, it was very important for all kinds of 
political uh, and um, strategic military reasons for the Bush administration to say over and over, Islam is a religion of peace, Islam is a religion of peace, Islam is a religion of peace. And um, so the kind of conversation that we're having now, we didn't have after 9-11. We didn't, the, the people who had a sense of Islam as being a real and present danger in America um, didn't really speak, uh, at least not as vociferously as they are now. So I think there's a way in which this is, a, this is, this is the 9-11 conversation, but it's a conversation we didn't have and we're having it now. And as difficult as it is, I, in my view at least, it's better to be having the conversation than not to be having it at all. This is a follow-up on the Islamophobia question, right? Yeah. Um, I just want to say I worked in the World Financial Center this summer, and so the anti-mosque protests were part of our daily commute. And I, don't, I can speak for our, my office, and we didn't care as long as the PATH station got done too. You know? So I'm, what I'm asking is what aren't we doing about Islamophobia that we need to be? I know that, I mean, I'm, my dad is a social studies teacher and I know that Islam is part of the social studies curriculum. I learned about it in elementary school and middle school in New Jersey and it's a national thing. And we're ha having this conversation. I know that Bloomberg got up and said, this shouldn't even be a discussion. Of course they can build it there. Obama said, this isn't a discussion. Of course they can build it there. And yet you're telling, you mentioned at the beginning of this that there are even a lot of people in the BU community who are uninformed formed and this is a liberal large private institution so what isn't getting done or is it just a matter of time mm. yeah it's a hard question Keep I'd just like to throw out there that I don't know what high school you went to but we didn't talk about Islam at my high school <laughs> um, education is determined state by state and even in local areas and in my public schools we did not talk about religion at all um, as is, I think, typical of a lot of places in America, uh, there were sort of undergirding assumptions about Judeo-Christian tradition and the way it related to American history, but there was no discussion of outsider religions. We sort of eliminated that from the discussion, even of the place of those groups in American history. One of the things I'm discovering with my dissertation research is that there was this very consistent move in the early 20th century to eliminate Mormonism and the part that the Mormon community played in settling the frontier west. We were frontier crazy in the early 20th century. We loved westerns, you know, movies, books, our frontier history and the way we settled the west. And the Mormons were an essential part of that. And yet they got pushed to the side in the telling of the history because a lot of Americans are uncomfortable with Mormonism. And so, um, I think it's fantastic that you were in an area where your social studies curriculum taught you so much, but a lot of people aren't. Keisha. I would say two things, and I'll be brief. One is that I think it's a mistake to think that learning about Islam and Muslims means learning about religion, right? I mean, Muslims are people, and if you wanted to learn about all the Christians in the world, you wouldn't just go to the New Testament, right? I mean, Muslim civilization has a long and extremely varied history, and so if your school taught you about Islam and didn't teach you about, say, the Silk Road, you know, the five pillars doesn't really begin to get at what we need to get at in terms of understanding this. On the second point of what we can do, well, we're doing it in this room, right? This is a start. Right over here. Um, I know about the five pillars, you know, but, but in the spirit of clarification, what I'm really not clear on is the concept of jihad, and it's mentioned so much, and I, I feel like every time I try and figure out what it is, someone tells me something different, if you could try and clear that up, that'd be great. Uh, don't tell us something different now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she already knows. I assume this falls to me, yeah? Okay. Um, so point one about representation is that in this representation, certain kinds of things get invoked and evoked over and over again. And one of them is jihad and the other one is sharia, right? It's revealed law and the two kind of dovetail. And this builds on exactly the pattern that Chrissy talked about in terms of seeing outsiders as violent. That said, jihad is something that Muslim scholars have been arguing over for about 1,400 years. Okay? So no wonder you're hearing different things because some people will say, well, it means an inner struggle against the base instincts of the self. You heard that a lot after 9-11, right? The greater and the lesser jihad perfectly valid, and there's certainly a strand within Muslim thought that thinks that. Then you heard 
Jihad is holy war, and every Muslim is obliged to wage it eternally against the unbelievers until Islam reigns supreme everywhere. And you know, there are some Muslims who think that. They're a tiny minority, and they're not really dominant anywhere, and they're not well supported in the texts. And then there's a huge middle ground from physical force is never legitimate to physical force is legitimate in a variety of circumstances. I would say, and again, I study Islamic law, but I mostly work on marriage. And you know, marriage is a struggle, but <laughs> you know, not always like that, thankfully. Um, I would say the dominant tradition sees defensive jihad, defensive war, very much as appropriate in all kinds of circumstances. This has an analog in the Catholic just war tradition, right? I mean, people have been fighting for a very long time over all kinds of things, and the work of the Muslim scholars has mostly been about how do you conduct yourself appropriately under these circumstances. Some people have seen offensive warfare, especially in the pre-modern era, as a legitimate part of Muslim tradition. That's history, right? We, we don't do ourselves any favors by ignoring that. But I think we do the truth, among other things, a disservice if we highlight that strand of Muslim history, just like we do ourselves a disservice if we focus on violent passages exclusively in the Quran, in the Bible, and, and don't pay attention to what are people doing with that now. The vast majority of the world's Muslims, the near totality of the world's Muslims, live in nation states governed by codes that are voted on by legislatures, okay? Civil governments, national laws, there is no universal thing called Sharia that they all want to apply, except in the sense that they believe that God has a plan for humanity. Well, you know, religious people tend to think that. And the question of how that relates to the laws that their governments promulgate, you know, that's, that's not really all that different for Muslims. So I have a quick follow-up myself. I'm hearing you say, oh, on the one hand, on the other hand, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be easier if Muslims could all just agree on all of this, or if there could be like some pope, like some Muslim pope? <laughs> who could just say, this is what Islam says, Because right? all Catholics agree with the Pope. <laughs> I think okay. Chrissy wins that point. Okay, right here. Uh, okay, well, uh, while we're on the topic of uh, terminology and misconceptions about Islam, uh, in following the debate over the Park 51 uh, Center, one word that I've learned, uh, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, is the word takia. Um, which, as I've read on the internet uh, by people who claim to be experts and probably aren't, involves uh, the uh, ability of uh, the oh, yeah okay dissimulation that's a good word the uh, ability or uh, requirement of Muslims uh, for Muslims to lie about their faith in order to advance the spread of Islam. And when I read about it, the subtext is you can't trust whatever they say about Part 51 because they're lying and it's all a big trick. Uh, which, of course, struck me immediately because that's what uh, many anti-Semites now and in the past have said about uh, the Kol Nidre prayer on uh, Yom Kippur Eve, which is going to be tomorrow. Uh, so that immediately sent up a red flag. But I'd like to know uh, from people who are not uh, dissimulating what exactly Takiyah is and what it means. And before you stop your question, could you tell us what the prayer is that's going to be uh, said on Yom Kippur? Okay. Uh, well, the Kol Nidre prayer, uh, which is a Jewish, uh, Jewish liturgical tradition, says that, you know, that... Uh, if you make a promise between yourself and God that you can't fulfill uh, after you've tried honestly, may God absolve you of having given the commitment. Uh, and people, notably Henry Ford, who you mentioned earlier in uh, his book, The International Jew, among others, claim that this is, you know, Jews always lie, and they have this prayer that they don't want to talk about to anybody in order to absolve them for lying. Uh, and, of course, it's not about lying between, you know, you and me. It's about if I'm in a big, bad situation and I say, God, if you help me, I'll never do I'll never, you know, break the commandments again, and I try hard and I can't do it, then God will forgive me for saying that in a moment of distress. But it's not about 
me ripping you off for twenty dollars. Okay. okay, great. I think this is Keisha. Is it? No, I, th I think I can do. This. She okay. does the shield, okay. so she gets okay, to talk about Takia. <laughs> I had no idea Takia came up with this um, in, in this context of. Uh, all right. <laughs> can I keep? Okay. And, and this is why the internet. I, I, and I'd be curious it's not to know why this particular term, but I mean, in terms of its. Um, historical context, it, I mean, it is something real. I mean, it was something real. And what did it refer to um, is pre precisely what um, Professor Ali just said, is this idea of dissimulation. Why did it happen? Well, not everybody, there were particular reasons and there were certain groups that actually um, took on this um, this practice and it had to do with I mean this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with diversity right I mean even within Islam um, amongst Muslims there there are so many different groups and so many different um, factions and divisions that there were there was persecution by Muslims from um, from other Muslims, right? And in fact, I would say that this is primarily what Takia was about, that there was a Sunni majority um, at a particular moment. They were Turks, um, Seljuk Turks, that were oppressing another another group that were called um, Ismailis, Muslims, right? And they would have to pretend and hide their practices from the majority. And this was happening at, at different periods in Islamic history. So here you have this concept that was actually, that we can really locate at specific times, at specific places, and within, within Islam, right? As something particular within Islam. And here you have, like Professor Ali was saying, like with this term Sharia or Jihad, now we have another, we have another term that's taken completely out of context um, and, you know, and basically given it's Islamophobic. Um, uh, so was it, was it sort of like the idea of um, sort of the secret Jew who pretended to be the Christian because they're living in medieval Spain or something? And they and they need to is is that what you're saying? Yeah, the context I mean, really they was? were they were persecuted by groups that because their practices and their politics were different, right? And um, so it's basically a dispensation that allows them, right, to seem to be going along with Sunni practices in order to protect their lives. It's a it's a dispensation. It's not a sort of general rule about how one goes about expressing one's political opinions or something like that. And of course, the vast majority of Muslims associated with this project, and in general, the ones who are sort of feared in America, or at least feared by the people who are out there demonstrating, reject this notion of dissimulation precisely because it's associated with a minority who doesn't have the approval of the larger group. We see here exactly an example of what Christy was talking about in terms of certain groups being perceived as untrustworthy and harboring hostile intentions that they don't want you to know about. In terms of this idea being alive, I've had an email exchange over the last couple of days with a Boston University student who, <coughs> who is getting most of her information about Islam from the Jihad Watch uh, website. And I told her, I said to her, I think you should broaden your um, sources on Islam and you should talk to Muslims and you should read some things that Muslims have written. And she wrote back to me and said, I'm not going to do that because all Muslims are told to lie and nothing that you hear from a Muslim can you believe because they have a religious obligation to lie about whatever you ask them about. So this isn't something that is just kind of crazy people on the web, it's also something that some Boston University, or at least one, Boston University student also believes. And it's something that Americans have said about Jews and about Catholics and about Mormons and about, I could just run down the list. Okay, this gentleman on, the on, the la on your right, yes. I have a larger question and a more specific one, which the more specific one is directed mainly at Professor Brogy. Uh, the larger question was raised earlier about the role that national, local, and civic governments should or shouldn't play in a debate like this. And my more specific question has to do with uh, how a civic government can block or promote something like building a cultural center or a mosque on bureaucratic technicalities or regulations. Yeah. Here in Boston, the existence of King's Chapel is owed entirely to the Anglican governor seizing land after no Puritan landowner would sell it to him to build an Anglican church. 
And uh, the example I was thinking of, uh, I grew up reading about various incidents in India filtered through the press and was surprised uh, as an adult when I was first planning a trip to discover that I had read about uh, mosques being destroyed in India and the rebuilding blocked more or less permanently by a refusal to issue permits. Uh, more recently, here in my native town of Brookline, there is a, a, a Mormon church which bought land and has been blocked on grounds of uh, excessive parking impact. And I was hoping that you could say a little bit about what we might be able to learn from others' example and then perhaps tackle the larger question of what government should or shouldn't do there. I'm glad that's your question. <laughs> I think I, I'm not really sure if I'm equipped to answer what the government can do in this question. I don't know if... Uh, can I say something quick about, um, about a law that's called the R-L-U-I-P-A? And I forget exactly what that stands for, except for the R is religious and A is act. <laughs> um, but it, it was passed 10 years ago. I think the anniversary is coming up within a week. I mean, it was passed unanimously in the House and the Senate. It's a law that prevents local, um, you know, municipal governments, um, town governments from blocking uh, religious buildings on grounds of things like parking and zoning, etc. It's a very, very powerful law. And it was passed uh, largely with, um, as a push from the religious right about 10 years ago in Washington. And uh, it's a perfect law to be applied to this question. If ever for example, if the Landmarks Commission had ruled in a different way on this Islamic Community Center, I think that they, uh, the people behind the Park 51 project could have e very easily used this law. Um, it, it's a law that basically reverts the courts back to a prior reading of the First Amendment, which makes it much more difficult to get the government's compelling interests, like we don't want too, much, you know, too many cars in, in the area. Um, it, makes it, much, it, it makes that barrier much higher to, to jump over. So that there is a law in, um, you know, a federal law in the United States that is, can, is used by Mormon groups to get their temples, is used by Buddhist groups to get their, um, their temples, and, and could definitely be used by mu Muslim groups on this mosque question. Okay, there's a, a, a question here. Yeah. Oh, and she's also been waiting. So there and then here. Yeah. Sure. No, you first. Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, my question may have many answers, um, but uh, how do we get the discussion uh, that we're having here today out of the universities and into the mainstream? Because uh, I know we've talked about the internet and the media, you know, soundbite uh, dominated and misinformation on the internet. How, how do we combat that in an effort to provide accurate information to the general public? Talk to people. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but there are a lot of people in my extended family and I have a lot of friends who strongly disagree with me about a lot of issues. And again, this goes back to the issue of whether or not we should be engaging in this debate. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a choice at this point as far as I see it. Whether we think that the premises of the debate are right or not, we have to try. And even when we feel like we're not being listened to, I think the answer is to continue talking to people civilly and as calmly as possible and to present as much factual information as we can and maybe they're not listening but maybe just maybe people who, who seem like they're not hearing you at all will walk away and remember one thing that you said one thing maybe they'll remember that taqiyya doesn't actually apply to all muslims dealing with non-muslims it's a minority muslim group back in history dealing with the larger muslim world if they remember that one thing that's improved something, right? So you just keep talking, calmly, civilly, rationally, but you keep talking. Um, we have a question here, and then we're going to probably have to cut off, but I'd love to hear from someone who has a more critical perspective on this project, because we've heard it seems like people who are mostly in favor of it. But, Steve, uh, the woman on the floor who's been she's waiting? She's right here. She's been waiting. Yeah, but she's first, right. and she's been Her waiting longer. Yep. So we're going to go to you. Yes. Yep. I want to hear how each panelist would best advocate um, maintaining the location of the mosque if they had to respond to someone who maybe lost someone in the 9-11 attacks and feels wronged by any Muslim, Islamic 
center or anything being established anywhere near the grounds. So I would start by saying it's not my job to advocate for any of those things, right? It's my job to point out when the premises of the conversation aren't dealing with facts, right? It's my job to point out that the conversation we need to be having as a broader community rests on things like minority rights and majority rights and who gets to have a say, right? It's my job to point out parallels with other things that are going on. It's other people's job to then take that information and have informed conversations. Okay, I think this is our last question. And after this, uh, we, we are all who are up here are happy to uh, stay and continue the, the conversation. But uh, this will be our last the part of our formal uh, presentation. And could you stand up so everyone can see you? Oh, sure. Thanks, Karen. Uh, hi. I was wondering if you could uh, speak to, um, I'm sorry, Professor Rohit, right? Purohit. Purohit, okay. Um, you were saying how there are Muslims from many cultural backgrounds, and I was wondering what the cultural background of the Muslims founding the community center is. Um, and also, the se I have another question, which is m related to the creation of memory mm -hmm. regarding what happened on September 11th and how uh, building a community center that has only one... Um, religion paid attention to within it would be sort of maybe an issue of contention for um, you know national images and memory of what happened thank you well um, I, the background of the you, you want to know the um, who is building the center um, the the imam and um, his wife are both Arab I believe this right it's not Arab Daisy's no, Arab South as Asian, well. isn't she? N oh. Well, see? Yeah. Things get fuzzy in yeah. America. Yeah. But, um, but the okay. imam is, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Faisal Abdul Rauf is, is second is generation Arab American. Um, I'm not sure where he's from, but I know he's, uh, he's Maybe Egyptian. Yeah. Maybe Syrian. Yeah. Which I think is a useful illustration of the fact that he's American. And he's lived his life in America, and, and you know, he's very much committed to being a New York Muslim as well as an American Muslim. Yeah. And as for other groups, I think that, um, you know, I mean, this is, like I said, I mean, this is also, I, I don't think it's going to be, I'm not sure if they did, if this, there's a final, final decision on this, but I'm not sure if it's exclusively going to be a Muslim space. I think that it's, it's supposed to be open to, to, other, um, to other religions and other communities as well. And other communities so, already have plenty of spaces in that neighborhood, and in fact the Muslims do as well. They're adding this community center to answer the needs of burgeoning mosques in the area that need more space. But if any of you visited um, Ground Zero in the years after 9-11, the impromptu shrine that immediately grew up around or across the street from uh, the World Trade Center site was the fence of an Anglican church. And in fact, um, the first time I visited after 9-11, 2001, um, I was circling the church looking at all of the uh, mementos left behind in different languages with different religious symbols on the fence around this church that had survived the damage that day. Um, and as my husband and I were walking around being very serious and thoughtful and looking at this multicultural display, um, a Lubavitcher Hasidic Jewish mitzvah mobile drove by blaring klezmer music from speakers on the outside of the van. And I thought, this is so American. <laughs> I thought this is so fabulously American. So the question of whether or not this space should be exclusively used by the Muslim community ignores the fact that there are already mosques in the area and that there are lots of churches and that there are Jewish communities in the area and that there are, you know, I couldn't even list them all. So this is not, this neighborhood is not an exclusively Muslim space. Thank you all for coming. We obviously did not answer all your questions. We're happy to talk some more, but we're also delighted to have a conversation here at Boston University where we try to discuss some of these contentious issues around religion in a way that's informed and that's civil. So thank you all for participating today and feel free to talk amongst yourselves 
and or to, and or to get out of this hot room. But um, we're, we're happy to field more questions up here. Thank you all for coming.